Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to the ongoing series, Talking Dance, sponsored by the Steps Beyond Foundation and Steps on Broadway. I'm Alan Manneker, Foundation Board Chair, and I'm going to be your host and interviewer. This series continues to present a, an exciting lineup of dance artists who will be sharing their stories and insights with you. They range from across the dance spectrum. The full lineup and information can be found at stepsbeyond, that's one word, dot org. There's also a place there to make a suggested donation should you be so inclined, which you hope you will be. Also, please note that you may enter your comments and questions in the chat, and we will make every effort to answer all questions asked. And if you'd like to let us know where in the world you're located and listening from, we would absolutely love to know. So tonight, Joshua Burgos is a dancer, choreographer, and a master teacher. He's been a guest artist at several universities. For television, he won an Emmy Award for choreography on NBC's musical drama, Smash. He also choreographed multiple segments on So You Think You Can Dance and PBS's Sinatra, A Voice for a Century. On Broadway, he choreographed the revival of On the Town. He received an Astaire Award and has been nominated for a Tony, Drama Desk, and Outer Critics Awards. He has also choreographed the revival of Gigi and the Broadway debut of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Off-Broadway credits include Sweet Charity, Cagney, Vomity of Errors, and Captain Louie. He is married to Sarah Mearns. Sarah Mearns is a principal dancer at New York City Ballet. She has danced in classical roles, Balanchine roles, and in contemporary pieces by Alexei Ratmansky, Justin Peck, and Christopher Wielden, among others. In 2015, she made her Broadway debut in the Tony-nominated musical On the Town. She has collaborated with the modern dance choreographer Jody Melnick, danced work for the Isadora Duncan Foundation, the Martha Graham Company, and the Ashler Boder Project. In 2017, Mearns performed the role of Victoria Page in Matthew Bourne's The Red Shoes in New York City Center. She is an in-demand speaker on injury prevention and an ambassador for several product lines. She is also married to Josh Burgos. They are the ultimate dance power couple and how fitting to have them on Valentine's Day, which I understand is the anniversary of their engagement. It is my pleasure to welcome them to Talking Dance. Hi, guys. Hi. Hello. How are you? Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day. Thanks. Thanks. Did you do anything to celebrate? Uh, we do. We, well, we bought plates. Yes, we bought plateware for each other. Dishware. You bought dishware. <laughs> well, how long have you guys been married? uh since 2018 in november so okay almost two and a half years there almost. you go okay Here. so i mean i i, I mean I, I know after 25 years my parents like bought vacuum cleaners and washing machines for each other and you guys <laughs> you guys from 2018 are already buying dishware for each other huh okay i mean so romantic it's right covid <laughs> times right like you know, we're trying to fix up our house, clean it, get rid of stuff we don't want. <laughs> right, right. Hey, well, that's a good thing. But, you know, I mean, I heard years ago that, uh, you know, if you were in the performing arts, you really shouldn't be with or marry someone in the performing arts. Um, did I get that wrong? It depends. I think, honestly. <laughs> like, the, the great thing about us, us is that you know, we're both in the performing arts, but we're in different, we do different things. You know, mine is a, or the musical theater Broadway thing and hers is ballet. And so, so we understand what each other goes through, but it doesn't like, it doesn't kind of interconnect in a, in a, a bad way. Yeah. Right? There could be days where we don't see each other for 12, 13 hours or like, you know, it's like we are in the same world in the same city, but not, really, because it's a completely separate world. Right. Yeah. Well, were th when you first got together, were there things that you had to teach each other about each other's worlds? 
Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I had very, uh, very little knowledge about the ballet world, except for what I saw on stage. But as far as the behind the scenes stuff, I had no idea. And I've learned a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I just think how our industries are run and how mine is nonprofit, his is commercial, and like all the aspects that have to do with that are so completely different. And sometimes it just boggles my mind how things are run on Broadway. And it's just, it's it's all the time. I'm just like, what, that really happens? Or that's how it works? It's just, it's so different how all of these institutions are run. And I'm just so used to the nonprofit world. And and yeah. you know, so it's it's just very, very, different. Well, do, you, do, you, do, you have a, do you have a specific example? I mean, just the fact that like, I'm, I stay with one institution for, I mean, I've been with New York City Ballet since 2003. And for Broadway shows, like, sometimes you only run for a year, sometimes you're only with a show or a company for a couple of months, and then you move on to another one. And you know, and you're constantly rotating and he's constantly working on different shows. And the fact, and I, I think sometimes he he also acts like this, but also like a lot of dance on Broadway, it's like dancing with the same people for like 18 years, you know? It's like, there's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> How do you do that? I, I, I mean, and for me, uh, you know, I can, you know, being in a nonprofit, for her being in the nonprofit world, they know their schedule three or four years from now. I can say to her, you know, if it wasn't, you know, COVIDian times, I could say, hey, what are you doing in, you know, March 3rd of 2024? She's, she can look at the calendar and say, well, I'll probably be doing Swan Lake. I'll have the evening show. My partner will be this. And for me, I have no idea what I've, I'm doing next month. You know, it's, it's, so, it's so different. Yeah. Well, but once a, but Josh, once a show gets uh, sort of formulated, you sort of have a, a schedule into time, don't you? Yes, yes. When, well, once yeah, once we start working on a project, we have a schedule. But then it, you know, in that same time, I'm working on multiple projects, and multi other projects can come in between. Um, so you still you still never know, and schedules will shift, you know, a lot more frequently than they would in a nonprofit situation. Yeah, I see. I mean, I know, like, you know, just like Union Rise and whatever, like we have to know our schedule long in advance just because that's how we, that's how it works. And, and also the company and the institutions have to do that. So um, yeah, like you said, like I know I have to schedule out like years in advance for my projects because I have to schedule my other projects outside of New York City Ballet around my layoff times from New York City Ballet. So it's, you know, it's, I don't know. It's just very interesting. The fact that like he won't know like a month beforehand. He's like, I don't really know if I'm doing the workshop then. I'm like, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, so Sarah, how much, how much off time from city ballet do you actually have in a year? Um, it's, it's interesting because other ballet companies, um, we're very different in the fact that like we have four very distinct seasons that we do. And, um, you know, we're not just, we don't just lump it all together in one season. So we have probably, we have a break in March for a couple of weeks. We have a break in June and then maybe a few weeks in August and then like two weeks in October. So it's, um, it's not that much time, but it's nice how it's spread out. So it's not just like a whole chunk of time that I used to have when I got into the company, it used to be that I had like three months off completely. And that was really hard for us as dancers. I mean, now I mean, it's been a year, but like at that time it was really hard to maintain for three months and like find work, you know, for three months long. But now since it's like broken up, it's very, it's much easier. And um, I think it's better for our bodies also not to have that. So like all that time off, um, mm -hmm. But I'm able to manage it, and I like to fill those weeks and that time with um, lots of other interesting, fun things to do. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I want to back up because I want to. I want to. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again for a second. Uh oh. Then no, no, no. I'm going to back up because I I want Josh to talk about 
<laughs> Annette and company. That's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's his mom's here. What is it? Warm. Established 1979, and it's still going now. Um, and tell us where it's located. Yes, it's in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Uh, it actually started out. Well, it started out on Greenfield Road, so that would still be Oak Park. It started out in Oak Park, Michigan, then moved to Farmington Hills, Michigan, which is a, a suburb of Detroit. Um, I started dancing when I was three there, had my first pair of tap shoes then, and um, I was terrible, uh, had no rhythm, um, and it wasn't until I was a teenager that I actually, it actually kind of clicked for me. But, um, yeah, it's it's uh, pretty amazing that that um, they're still going. My you know my brother runs it, and um, they're still going even during the the pandemic. Wow, fantastic! Now I understand your brother uh, was in West Side Story, as were you. Yes. So so I was. Um, so I have a like a kind of a history with West Side Story. I was the assistant to the director choreographer who was in the original production back in 1957. Um, and so we were doing a European tour and there was a layoff. We were, we, I think we were in Germany. I, oh, I forget, uh, God, it was so long ago, but anyway, so, so we were down a, a jet and I said, well, how about my brother? I, I told the, my boss, the director choreographer, Alan Johnson. And he said, sure, he trusted me. So, um, I taught him we on the layoff. I, I came home to Michigan and taught him the choreography, and then he came he came out to Europe and did the tour with us. Wow, and that, that's amazing. And then also I hear in the, I see in the chat my cousin who's from Michigan, Carol, said my daughter in law danced there for years. So I, I told you, you company. Here. There's a there's a definite uh, Michigan and Detroit connection here, which is That's great. Awesome. That's cute. So were your parents uh, now to run a school and encouraging a professional career in dance are two different things. Were they encouraging of you to pursue it professionally? Yeah, yes. Yes, totally. Actually, um, uh, you know, I was originally not going to um, pursue a performing career. I was going to just stay at the studio and teach and, and run the studio, but I ended up falling into performing and they were very encouraging about it. Mm. So, and when did you first start choreographing? It was at the dance studio. Uh, I would, when I was a teenager and I started, you know, like I said, it clicked then and it started, you know, started, I, felt good in my body, the, the, the choreography I was doing. Then I started choreographing for the recitals and competitions and, and things like that. And, and that's where I kind of got the choreography bug. So when I moved to New York, uh, between my performing jobs, I would take on uh, small choreography jobs for showcases or benefits kind of to, to pass the time. And then, you know, one day I got paid for it and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, so I slowly tried to build that career alongside my performing career. And then when I got to a certain age, I, I decided to focus on the choreography and I kind of retired as a performer. Mm. But so who, who influenced you in terms of your choreography? And I don't mean like Astaire or Fosse, but I mean every choreographer that's coming up needs someone to step back and say, Hey, listen, this, this part was good. This wasn't maybe rework this. Did you have someone like that for you? Um, you know, uh, my mentor was Alan Johnson, the person who I assisted who was at, with the West Side Story. Um, and he was also a Broadway choreographer. He did, he did the Mel Brooks film. So he was a comedic, very, very witty choreographer. Um, he did a lot of TV specials for, uh, you know, for um, Shirley MacLaine and Liza Minnelli. Um, so uh, that was that was kind of my mentor as I was coming up. Mm, mm, that's great. So, okay, so now I'm gonna share again my screen so that we can look at something. Okay. And let's see.
Yay! <laughs> wow, yay. Well, Sarah, I saw you shaking it a little bit there. You like that. I do. I love Smash. <laughs> but Josh, was it, was it, did they get it right? Is that the way putting on a musical is about? Um, yeah, you know what? It's so funny because I get this question a lot and we got a lot of criticism a lot about, you know, especially from people in the industry where they said, oh, that's not how it happened. That's, it doesn't happen like that. That doesn't happen. And what was so funny is that most of the stuff that was written for the series was based on actual events. Um, you know, not necessarily people, those people, but, you know, the people writing for the series would say, hey, this thing happened when we were rehearsing for a show. Oh, let's do an episode about that. Um, you know, uh, so and a lot of, and also a lot of the drama and the, the, the personal relationships and all that stuff all happens backstage. Uh, so, yeah, I think they got it right. I think they really did. Um, you know, of course, it was it was, you know, a made for TV drama. So they embellished things a bit. But right. Yeah. Were you were you the one that hired the dancers or chose the dancers, I should say? Yes. Yes. I chose the dancers. Mm -hmm. And then once you uh, because were you able to choreograph with television in mind or were you choreographing for stage that then got translated into television. Right. Well, what happened, you know, I didn't have television experience really at the, when we, when I got the job. So basically the, the, what saved me was that my assignment for each episode was to choreograph a number that would be on a Broadway stage. So, um, so I did that and then they filmed, they would film it and it, and then I would see how they would edit it and, and what looks good and what, would end up making the cut. And so then as we went on through the series, I realized, okay, now I know how to actually choreograph for the camera and to make it easier on myself and also on the director and the cinematographer and everybody. Uh, so it was a learning experience and I think it got easier and better as I went along. Um, yeah. Do you have an example of something that you actually learned? Well, I mean, you know, it's simple stuff, kind of like, like for that, for that number, National Pastime, that was the first number I did for the show. That was in the pilot. And I made sure everything was so meticulous, not only just what Megan Hilty was doing, but everybody on the peripheral. What, like I, I drilled and drilled and drilled. And then, you know, realized once we saw the final edit that there's so much that I worked on that never made it to the cut and never was going to because it wasn't part of the, the, the central action. So what I was able to do then is realize, okay, if they're not near Megan or if it's not a great shot of something else, I don't have to focus on that. I don't have to spend time on what the, what's in the periphery. It's really what is the, what is the central action? I see. That's, that's amazing. So different than what you think. So, yeah. so, different. so different because when you're doing it for film, for camera, the camera tells you what to look at, obviously. But when you're doing, when you're doing it for stage, when you're doing it for Broadway, you have, to, you have to tell the audience, as the choreographer, you have to tell the audience what to look at. And you have to design it so they can follow the story, but yet everything looks beautiful. Mm, mm, wonderful, wonderful. So Miss Sarah, let's talk about you. You began, okay. you began dancing at age three. Do you remember I what it was like did. in those extremely early years in the dance studio? I mean, can you remember what even excited you when you first started? Um, I don't think I remember specific moments, but my mom always told me that I was kicking and screaming and crying going into the studio. And then once I got in there, that I was fine, that I was okay. It was like having to get in there. And I do remember like my first like friends, I was, I'm still friends with them today. One of my best friends, Christian Porzanski, he was in my first ballet class and we traveled like through the systems together. Like we, and we were in New York, we were in New York City Ballet together for many years. Um, so I do remember those moments. And obviously I remember like the recitals and like all the ballet numbers we did. And like I did tap jazz and I did comp like tap jazz competitions and like, 
all of that is still very, very vivid in my head. And um, I loved all of it. And it was, it was my life basically, right? It was, there was nothing else that it, like my, that was it besides like going to academic school. So yeah. And how, about, and, and how about you with your parents when you first uh, made sounds that uh, this might be a profession for you? Were they supportive of that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, my mom was like that. She made everything happen. She, you know, she was the one that put me in ballet. She was the one that would take me to the studio every day. And then my brother got involved into, in dance. And so we were both there and it was, you know, she would make my costume. She would make everybody's costume. She would help sew them. She would do everything. And then she would drive us to SAB in the summers, you know, from South Carolina. And so she's been there every step of the way. And of course, I mean, yes, it's really hard to let your child go at such a young age, but I do think that she understood that if I was going to go professional, if I was going to make it, and my teacher, Ann Brody, Miss Ann Brody, who passed away when I was young and the studio closed, she said, Sarah needs to go to New York. She needs to be in New York. She needs to go to SAB. She needs to go to New York City Ballet. Like, that's what she has to do. And so my mom just sort of, like, made that happen and, you know, did everything we could to, to make that happen. So... And so it was, you were 15 when you moved up to the city? Gosh, I think I was 16 already. I think I was- 16. Yeah, I was already 16 when I got there. I mean, I might be really messing this up. No, I was definitely 16. Yeah, because I went 16. to SCB for four summers. I went to SCB when I was 12, my first summer, and I went there for four summers. And then I stayed for the year after my fourth summer. So, yeah. And were they, and did, did, did either of your folks come up and stay with you or were you on your own? No, I, my brother was actually already at the school for the year term. Um, and uh, no, the, I think since I've been going there for the summer programs and my brother was already there, like my mom was very comfortable with the situation and the environment that I was in because we're at Lincoln Center and it's a very safe environment in this area. So we were very aware of everything. Um, but unfortunately, two weeks after I moved up there, September 11th happened. So it's sort of everything got real crazy, but she knew that my brother and I were together and that it was gonna be okay. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, we always felt like it was a very um, okay environment to be in. I was never nervous or scared or anything. Right. But so um, when you first started coming up in the summer and you were coming up from where? South Carolina? Yeah. Uh, was there, so New York is a, is a very ultra competitive kind of a place. Was it a kind of a cold water in your face to confront the competition and the competitive nature that uh, was happening up here? I mean, I don't really remember being nervous or scared about the competition. I remember that there was a lot of students. There was a lot of really, really talented girls around me. That's what I remember. And I remember that uh, it made me work harder, but I wasn't like competing with them. You know, if that makes sense, like it, it was just like it, it made me work harder and inspired me to work harder. Um, and I, you know, I was very aware around the third or fourth summer that I was not in the top of the class ever. And I was really, um, you know, it's sort of like getting by and uh, because, you know, they accept students from all over the country and there's just so much insane talent out there. And they were all there at, near, at SAB. So I was sort of just like middle range bottom. And that's why, you know, I asked them to stay at the end of the fourth summer because I didn't have anywhere else to go. And I knew if I went back to South Carolina, I probably would have stopped dancing. Um, so but Sarah, let, let me interrupt for a second. How did you know? What, what told you that you were maybe at the, not at the top of the class? How did you know that? I just, from looking at the other girls around me, like I just knew it. I didn't have their jump. I didn't have their extensions. I didn't have like the persist, like the precision. And like, 
I just, I knew that I, I had a lot to work on. I don't, it, it wasn't that like the teachers told me that it wasn't that, um, you know, the other girls were telling me that it wasn't about that. It was just like, I was very aware of what I was seeing and what and how I was looking up against them. So, um, but I did have this, this insane passion for dance. And I was always just trying to get into the front. And I was like, I would move around the studio and I was first in the studio, last to leave. Um, and I just loved, loved dancing. And because I was doing recitals and competitions from such a young age, not to win them, I never won a competition by myself ever, but it wasn't about that. My teacher, my tap teacher wanted us to get out there and perform in front of people. He wanted us to get the nerves out of us and be comfortable on stage. Um, so I think that's what really, really helped me um, mm -hmm. when I got into situations like that. So I wasn't, I wouldn't get nervous. I would just like be myself and dance and um, yeah. But so I'm also curious, um, those girls that you thought were so much better than you, do you know where they are now? I do. You do? I do yeah. know where they are now. Um, I mean, a lot of them did make it into, they did make it into the company. They're still there now. Um, so did, some did make it into the company and then they left and they went to school and like, you know, they have business majors and like, you know, they're doing other incredible things. Um, some didn't stay at SAB, some left. I mean, it's just, it's, it is crazy to think about like the trajectory of everybody that went there and who like kept on going and who didn't. Um, yeah. I just think I, was, I would never take no for an answer, basically, even though yeah. I knew that I was going to have to work twice as hard as everybody else. I just was never going to take no for an answer. And I was just going to like show them that I could be there and that I could do it, even though it was going to be really hard. Mm. And you've danced so many roles at City Ballet. Do you have a favorite? Oh, gosh. That is such a hard question, Alan. Oh, well, my Goodness. It's not supposed to be easy here, Sarah. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, um, okay, that's true. I've done a lot. I mean, when I'll I first- take your I'll take your top three. Okay. Your top three favorites. Oh, that's even hurt. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess up there is Diamonds, Balanchine's Diamonds, which is a, you know, a huge favorite of mine, and I just- Everything about it, I think, it's is one perfect. of my favorites. Mm. Okay, see, so Josh, that was the next question. If her list was the same as yours, so pay attention. Okay. And so diamonds. Diamonds is definitely one of my favorites. Um, Swan Lake is one of my favorites. It's like for some reason, it's I've done it for so many years now that there's so many other things that I've done that are equal to it, but. Um, you know, a lot of my rep is balancing and a lot of most of my rep when I got in became a principal was all balancing and a lot of drum robins. So that's a lot of stuff that I love to do, but also like Justin Peck, like getting to do his ballets and to create new roles with him and to create new roles with Alexei Ratmansky. I mean, it's just like, that's like a dream come true to have something like that. So I would say like Rodeo from Justin Peck and like Namuna from Alexei Ratmansky or like, Pictures and okay. I know they so Josh, is that your list too? Yeah, it's that's some pretty good stuff. I mean, rodeo. I love I love her and rodeo, and and definitely, you know, I'm also a sucker for the sugar plum fairy when she does it. I mean, I think that it's a pot. It's a great pot of the, but it but also good. there's Faust. Yes, there is. That's really cool too. Well, it's called Walpurgis Knot, technically, but we right. call it Faust because it's easier to say because it's the the music. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, okay. there's, you know, there's you, so many good ones. <laughs> All right, well, so then let's watch you do one, okay? <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen, and you're even going to talk about it. So no, not, you're going to hear me, right, on the video, right? We're going to hear you, so you're going to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's the whole thing. Oh gosh, it's my I'm Sarah Mearns, and here I'm dancing my solo from Alexei Ratmansky's Namuna. This solo is probably the hardest two minutes I have ever performed on stage, ever in my career up to this date. 
and I've done a lot of things. I remember the first time we debuted it, I lost all muscle control at the end of the solo, and I actually didn't know if I was gonna make it through at all. Like, I couldn't even feel my legs, I couldn't feel my feet, anything. It was terrifying. But Alexi gives you this confidence that you can do anything. And he choreographed this insane solo on me. So I felt like I could do anything. And by the end of the first season that we did it, I really kind of felt like Superwoman. This next section is the breathing moment because there's no jumps, there's no turns, it's just tondus but he wants them to be as stretched out as possible. So I have to keep moving, even though I'm not moving. And then here, what's coming up is the big jumping section. And I never really considered myself a big jumper, but for some reason he saw me like that and he gave me this solo with all jumps. But I guess I am a jumper now looking at this. <laughs> Alexi has called me a stage animal which is kind of awesome. And I really do feel like that when I'm dancing his ballets. I don't feel like I'm a human being. And here I just kind of let go because it's the end. The first version of this solo and the ending, he had me go to the ground, roll around and then stand up and end like that. And we tried it and I never made it. So he was just like, just end on the floor with your head back. I was like, thank you very much, which is kind of awesome because it's so hard that I'd rather just end on the floor. <laughs> it's true. I never was able to get back up after that. Like that, was, that was awesome. That was awesome, Sarah. But what I love is that during Josh's little video, you're like, and for this, you're like this. <laughs> what, what were you thinking? Like everything bad. Like I'm looking for the bad things. Like at the end there. Like, but also when you work with somebody like Alexei Ravansky, he demands perfection, which he should because that's who he is, and his work demands that. But so when I see the, when I watch myself, I'm seeing. I'm like, oh god, I know I'm not hitting fifth. Oh, he wants fifth there. Okay. I need to point there because I see like what he's saying, but when I'm on stage, I really think I'm doing it. Like I really, I'm like, <laughs> I'm definitely hitting fifth. And then I watch that and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> right? Like my foot's not pointed. I'm like, I'm really thinking about my foot being pointed. And then I watch that and it's just like, not. That's <laughs> such a, that's such a dancer point of view, isn't it? <laughs> You know, nothing's nothing's ever good enough. There's always there's always a moment that could have been better. You could have had a tighter fifth, could have had a cleaner turn. You know, that's such a dancer way of looking at things. Yeah, you're, right? lucky, you're lucky she actually stayed and watched that. Normally, if she has a video of herself, she leaves the room. <laughs> but so you, you've been a dancer that have, has not been afraid to move outside of your comfort zone. I mean, works by Isadora Duncan, contemporary choreographers, even your husband, you know? So how, how, do you, how do you choose those projects when you move outside of New York City Ballet? Um, you know, it's interesting. I don't feel like, well, now I'm choosing, but when it all started, I, I really wasn't choosing. It was sort of like, I started working with someone, Jody Melnick, a very very dear friend now and she um she was sort of the first person i worked with outside of my ballerina bubble and that opened my eyes to other things in new york which was kind of insane because this is like the biggest dance hub of every kind of dance you can ever imagine is here in new york city so that opened my eyes to everything and sort of when i started working with her and then other people started seeing that that i was working outside of ballet and then they're like well what if you would you want to do this or like would you be interested in doing this and then it sort of just started snowballing into this thing and then i you know i started doing like isadora duncan things which i never thought i would do but then that that led me to doing the merce cunningham centennial which is like huge in the dance world i never like i never that would never be on my radar but like the fact that i got asked to do that because of isadora duncan and then also I got asked to do a grand thing because I was doing this Cunningham stuff. And then 
it just like led to all these other things. And I feel like I'm very grateful for that. It just takes like one thing and then it's sort of, everything starts to happen. But now that I'm on that like rack, I start, I'm now seeking out other people that I would never normally work with or be on my radar or would know about me in the ballet world actually. Like I'd rather like them be like, oh, so tell me about yourself. So it's like a clean slate almost. And then um, we we build something together. So that's- well, Who's on the short list of who you'd like to be with, work, to work with rather? Well, short list, I mean, there's a very famous part for Crystal Pike who everybody wants to work with. And like, you know, she's just so, she's such in demand that, um, you know, I don't think it's probably impossible right now, but she's definitely somebody. Um, there's many, many people in New York that I would love to work with. I mean, I'm not gonna say it on here. <laughs> <laughs> Why, it's just between you and me. <laughs> no, but I definitely have like a list of people that it's, you know, I'm constantly like seeking, but it's also has to be the right moment, right? It can't just be anything. It can't just be, you know, some little thing. You have to like cultivate it and like build a relationship and then um, hopefully something will happen. Right. Well, whose idea was on the town for you to dance in on the town? You want to tell this funny story, I, yes, honey? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, we did it. We did a workshop of on the town, um, and and uh, Sarah created this pot de deux. So I, I, she created this pot de deux with an old uh, a partner of hers, former partner Stephen Hanna, uh, in the workshop. And I but, didn't create it. I was I was choreographed on. By well, him. you're right, right. So we created it on Sarah and Stephen. Um, and then you know when when on the town uh, got a theater and, and we went to Broadway, uh, you know Sarah obviously had her commitments with New York City Ballet, so there was no way that she could do the Broadway show. So um, then once we were in the run. Uh, there were three ladies who knew. Wait, he's missing a very like important element. I joked to him when we were at the workshop or something, or like he was putting the show together in the theater. I was like, oh my God, what if I had to like come and like do this? Like, that would be so funny if I just had to like drop in and like do this one thing. And then like, of course we like so, forgot about it, it never happened. So but, fast forward to there's one afternoon where the stage manager calls me and says, all of the three ladies who know the choreography to the pot de deux, uh, are out, they can't do it. And, and, and they were trying to, they, they said, should we cut it? We can't, no, no, we can't do that. It's gonna mess everything up. And so she was in rehearsal for, for City Ballet and I just left her a message. I said, honey, you're going on tonight. <laughs> you're gonna make your Broadway debut. And so, it was 4.30 in the afternoon. Yeah, and the show was at 7, probably, right? Yeah. So so then she came, she called me back it, it when, after year. rehearsal and it said, been, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> it had been a year. It had been a year since she did it. I totally and, forgot about it. And so she, she we took her to the theater right after she was done at City Ballet, took her to the theater, tried on a costume. She had like a 10-minute rehearsal with Steven and then That's curtain it. up and... She, she made a Broadway debut and, and it, she was brilliant. It was, it was, it was so weird. It's like, I think about it and I'm just like, did that happen? Like I was just like literally an hour and like that was it. But like, I love because Megan Fairchild, who was the lead in on, she was there backstage and she was like, ah! <laughs> I was there doing that too. Yeah. Yeah. It was so cool. I mean, if I had not been with Stephen Hanna, because I had danced with Stephen Hanna for many, many years at New York City Ballet as principal dancers, and you know that's what made it really easy because we didn't have to rehearse. Like we just knew how to dance with each other, and like we, it just like was sort. So it's sort of like the perfect like little situation for like a, a throw on. And then also, but also because of her training and her experience, um, it, it, she just remembers material so easily. Uh, you know, if she know, learned something from a year ago, it's not like she forgets it. You know, it's still in her body. And, mm. so, you know, it just took them, it literally took them minutes to go over it. And, and then she was ready to go. It was, it was um, yeah, it was so cool. It was so fun. So, 
So how is he as a choreographer? Is he a taskmaster or uh, is he kind of like, oh, do it this way, do what you feel comfortable or no, it's this way, make it this way. Yeah, that's what it is. I mean, our first experience, yeah. our first experience was a piece we did for the Fire Island Dance Festival, correct? That was before yeah, I think so. Yep, yep. That was before on the town. And that was a little rough. I'm just going to be honest. It was just like, I didn't know how he worked in the studio. He didn't know how I had worked in the studio. And like, it was sort of like we were like thrust into this situation. And like, we were both just like, yeah, it'll be great. It'll be fine. And then we're both like, wait. <laughs> wait, wait the, the, the Fire Iron Dance Festival is you were already a couple or you had not, yes. you were not a couple yet. But it, was very, right. it was like the right. first year in our yeah. relationship. And, um, it was a great number. It was me with eight guys and they were like throwing me around and like whatever. And then I had this part that was by myself and whatever. And um, I don't know, I just, by that point I had like a certain way of rehearsing. Like I don't rehearse full out like the whole time in rehearsal. And like, he just couldn't like wrap his brain around that. <laughs> and I would always say to him, I'd be like, honey, I'll do it when I need to. Like, just trust me, like when I get out there, I'll do it. And he's just like, no. <laughs> No, no, no! Like, I'm not gonna do a full out right now. I'm sorry. Wait, so, so, so who won? Who we won like, that argument? Uh, I don't know that anybody really won. <laughs> yeah, no. No. But, but then, but but then we've worked together since then, and now that we understand each other's working, you know, styles, it's easier. I would say. Would Would you agree? Yes, we did a massive musical at City Center, an on-course production, I Married an Angel. And it was even, um, it was like a pressure cooker situation because you had like two and a half weeks, put the whole thing together and he had to direct and choreograph it. And he had a lot of people to look after. And I had like, it was the first time that I was like actually speaking on stage. And so it was a huge like thing. And also we were in the middle of buying our apartment. We were literally <laughs> in the middle of doing our whole package, our board package. So it was a very, very stressful time, but for some reason we had known by then like how to gauge like when to like approach him and not. <laughs> right. And I knew what to expect. I was like, he's not going to do it full out. It's going to be fine. <laughs> I know it's going to be fine on opening night. I'm not going to worry. Like, so, do it. So like I do it right. But like, I'm not like, I'm, one to like not perform it in a rehearsal because I'm still working things out. And it's like, I'm not going to put that kind of energy into a rehearsal when I still need to work things out. So, but because that's how we work at New York City Ballet, it's like, it's very like, we have to get things together really fast and then we bring it on like 110% on stage. And that's when we have to save it for that stage moment because we have so much going on. And I'm just used to that, and now he gets it. It's fine. It's all good now. It's all good. Yeah. But so that when you were during that stressful time at City Center, did it come home with you, or were you able to leave that in the theater? I don't really did, remember. I mean, it, well, it it was stressful, but we there wasn't a stress between us. No. It was the, the pressure of like making sure the show was great and we were all doing great work. But there was no like tension between us, I think. So coming home, you know, we were able to let it just kind of like let it go and relax. I think we wanted to like just like breathe for a second. But we were also able to discuss things and say, hey, you know, I think in this moment in the show, we can do something like this. Hey, and, and you know, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe that's a bad idea. Um, but it wasn't obsessive when we came home talking no. about the work. No. Mm -hmm. We're just well, Right. Sorry. We're just too tired at that point. It's like, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to talk about it. Like you're exhausted. You just want to eat and go. To sleep. We'll deal with it tomorrow at rehearsal. Well, have there ever been pieces where like one of you loves it and the other one hates it? Or like, vice versa? Like something we've like done together. No, no. Something that you've watched and, and you'll go, God, that really oh, yeah. stunk. And the other one, like. Sure. There's many shows that we have gone together and I've actually, there's one show I left at intermission and he stayed. Really? <laughs> I was like, no. oh, I can't. I, I was go. like, this is so cool. She's like, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> and I left. <laughs> oh boy, and Josh, how did you have to explain that? Where's what your wife? 
Well, how did you explain that? Oh, she, she wasn't feeling well. Well, you know, the, tr <laughs> the, tr the trick is, the, the secret trick is you just don't tell people that you're at the show. That's true. So, <laughs> So if they don't if they don't know you're at the show, then if she leaves, nobody knows. Yeah, and you like ghost out. Like it's intermission. So like you just get up as you're going to the bathroom and then you just like never come back. And like, <laughs> I just did it. Like I really it was like a passionate thing for that show. I was like, I cannot sit through another act of it. But you know, whatever, it's fine. I mean, there's things that I love and he's just like, oh my God. Yeah. Like how? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you, John, well, Josh, have you had the same experience where oh, oh, there's yeah. something that, you're, that she loves and you just can't stand? Yes, yes, certainly. Like, like, uh, like if uh, there are ballets that I'll say, you know, I just, I, I don't like it. And she's like, how do you not like that? It's so funny. And it's, it's, it's like a part of history and it's this and that. And it's like, eh, I, I was kind of bored. Um, <laughs> okay. Like, yeah. Are you but you've never, it? you've never left it intermission. Um, I, sometimes I only leave it intermission when she tells me to. When she's backstage and she says, "I'm done. I'm in my dressing room. I want you to come visit me in my dressing room." That's true. And that, <laughs> that's when I'm not allowed to see the rest of the show. I see. Okay. Well, we all have our we all have our mask our taskmasters, yes. don't we? Yes. That we I have would, to listen to. I would like to stay. But she says, no, nope, you got to come backstage. Yeah. So now let me, t let me t t turn to something kind of serious about today's world. How have you guys been coping during COVID and all of this craziness and lockdown and horrible loss of Broadway in the theater? And can you talk about it? Um, yeah. Well, uh, you know, I think, gosh, it's so hard. Um, Work-wise, I mean, you know, career-wise, it's been it's been challenging. But but at least for for me, the whole thing has been focusing on future and uh, the future and development of the projects that that I have, and that's that's where my you know all my colleagues are as well. It's like you know all the producers and the writers and they're we we basically just been saying okay so how do we get ready for when this comes back let's make our show better let's rewrite it let's write new songs let's uh, you know what i mean so we've been really doing a tons of homework uh to to develop the 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 shows and the projects and make them even better so so that they're ready uh but but you know it's hard and you have to take it you, you kind of have to take it day by day and, and, and some days you have to be okay with just, just, um, you know, not, not being happy and, and just dealing with that. And then other days, you know, you, you have, you have good news and, and, and you kind of, uh, you know, thrive on that. Um, it's been, it's been particularly hard, I think for the Broadway community because, you know, we've been totally shut down. And it's and, and there's really not much going on, especially for musicals um, and choreography for musicals. I think w what's been inspiring to me, I think, is the stuff that Sarah's been doing and been able to do, which has uh, been very inventive and, and, and really inspirational. I think you should talk about some of the things you've been able to do which is more interesting than the, than the things I haven't been able to do. <laughs> yeah. But first, Sarah, how are you coping? How are you coping? And then tell us what you've been doing. Well, in the first couple of months last year, um, it's funny, I did a, an interview the other day. I was writing and answering a question, and they said, you know, how was it the beginning of this pandemic? And I said, well, you know, I was upset about our life being shut down, but I was more upset about what was happening in New York to people dying and the world. Like it was so consuming and I just, we would sit here and watch the news and I just could not believe what was happening. And that's what made it really hard for me. Um, and, I, and I knew that we couldn't be, like there's no way I could go to work. There's no way that our life could exist until this was over. So. But the beginning was very, very tough for me just because I felt like I was 
and a lot of us at Nervous Valley and a lot of dancers we feel the same way is that we are at this high point of our physicality and of our career, you know, at the end of winter season last year. And we we're sort of on this roll that like, we were just, we we're on a high. And to have like everything being taken away from you and it not being an injury is very, very mentally hard. Cause I've been there before twice with injuries and I under, I know what that feels like. And I understand that, but this was very, very different. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I could, I could say I was a very, I was in a deep, deep depression. I mean, you don't realize it until you come out of it and you're past it. Um, but then, you know, I am very grateful and lucky to have made connections outside of New York City Ballet for the past couple of years. So I was able to cultivate these other projects um, the past months and doing these films and working with people that I never would have worked with if it wasn't for COVID, which is also very, very weird and strange to say because, um, you know, I, I know there's a lot of love hurting and not working and I completely understand that and I think you know also living in New York we're hustlers and we make things happen even when it's not possible to happen we somehow make things work and we get things done and that's what we sort of started doing last the end of the summer and beginning of the fall everybody was just like what do we do how do we do this how I know there's a way to do it there's got to be calls there's got to be something we can do to get things out there to get content out there to get people working in some capacity and i was very grateful to be part of a lot of those things that happened at city center and at the joyce and at works in process um we have a new project that we're working on actually that we got to start working on um we're doing a new project of uh, seven deadly things and so we actually got to start working on that which is also really great um so it's just now um, just looking forward and knowing that we are going to get out of this and that we see a light at the end of the tunnel now, but I'm still in this mode of like hustling to, from project to project to project and like, okay, what can I do next? What can I do now? What can I do that I wouldn't be able to do during New York City Ballet time? So I'm trying to like stay in that mentality so I don't get um, depressed again and go to that really, really bad place. I just can't survive in that, so... Right. Well, do you think that the dance world will have been changed permanently for either one of you? Um, I guess we <laughs> have to wait and see. I mean, we, you know, yes, I think institutions are looking at, you know, this really like threw them a curveball. Nobody was ready for this. Nobody was ready for this. And they have to think differently now. They have to think, how are we going to get content out there? How do we get people working without completely shutting down again? Um, and, you know, we're just going to have to wait and see. I know that they're doing a lot of work behind the scenes that we don't probably know about or I'm not aware of, but I know that they're rethinking a lot of things and also just how to open again. Like, we're not going to be able to open just like, everybody come into the theater. Like, you know, it's not going to be like that. There's still going to be restrictions. There's still going to be protocols. And we're all going to have, it's going to be a new reality for a while. But the fact is, is that we'll be back performing, experiencing live art again, and performance art, which is, that's what we need. And in some capacity. Mm -hmm. Do you feel the same way, Josh? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, especially for Broadway and commercial theater, it's, it's, it's going to be challenging because we rely so much on tourism. And, you know, so, so listen, you can say COVID's gone or, or, you know, we've got a vaccine and we're testing and everything's great and open all the Broadway shows and 40 Broadway shows open, but there, who's going to be there to see it, you know, is, uh, you know, it, it, so, so it's going to be It's going to be a challenging thing to try and figure out how do we get the industry back up on its feet, uh, especially you know when you think about the the running cost of of a Broadway show. You know, it's it's really expensive to first of all get it up so that and get it open, but then also to to run it, and so you have to really sell a lot of tickets. Um, I, what I think is um, that theaters around the country, regional theaters and touring houses and things like that, I think they're going to open sooner and faster than the 
the whole Broadway, you know, getting Broadway 100% to where it was. Because, you know, people, you know, in say even in Michigan, in our hometown in Detroit, they can go, you know, to the Fisher Theater or to a regional theater there and not have to take the trip to New York. And, and you know, it's just the traveling, I think it's gonna take a while for people to be comfortable doing that again. Um, so, so I'm, I'm really excited that, that regional theaters and touring houses are going to probably bounce back pretty, pretty soon. I would say in the fall, they'll be doing pretty well. That's, that's my guess and my hope. Wow. Well, it's great that you're, it sounds like you're both optimistic, which is what we need these days, right? It's, it's optimism. <laughs> Yeah, we have to be after so right. much not yeah. being that all of that. I mean, most of last year, you have to look forward now. Right. Absolutely. So, guys, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Oh. And I, it's an hour gone by. And oh. I really wanted to thank you so much for talking to me today and sharing your story and your insights and what it's been like for you and Coming up, it's just really been a pleasure. So thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's yes. Great. So good night to you too. Good night. Bye. Bye. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all uh, for tuning in as well. If you've enjoyed the interview, please consider donating at stepsbeyond.org. You can also go to our YouTube channel, the Steps Beyond Foundation, and subscribe. Please tune in again to an important Steps Beyond Foundation event on February 21st. February 21st at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, when we will be presenting as a part of the Artist Talk series a panel on activism in dance, moderated by noted African American choreographer Donald Byrd. He and the panel of choreographers, dance historians, scholars, and cultural observers will explore historical perspectives on activism in dance and how they relate to today's current cultural and social climate. So once again, thank you to all of you. Thank you for tuning in and good night. <laughs>